everybody. This is Michael Cottle. I'm the director of the Larimer SBDC. Um, can everybody hear me okay? Quick question on that. All right, I'm getting a thumbs up. Um, uh, for those of you that have not heard of the SBDC or the Loveland Business Development Center, our mission is to do street smart business education and connection to resources. Uh, we get partially funded by the SBA, so whenever there is uh, uh, a disaster or a crisis such as the flood recovery work that happened in Estes Park and Southwest Loveland uh, in 2013, we were pretty heavily involved with that and helping businesses uh, recover. And um, uh, that's kind of above and beyond our normal mission of business education and one-on-one -on -one consulting. Uh, what I want to talk about today, I'm going to kind of kick this off with some introductory comments and, uh, and then Kat's going to uh, do the same, but uh, um, you've probably seen a flood of emails about these various programs and describing the programs and I'm going to talk from the business owner standpoint about what that means. I'm going to put out some specific recommendations that we have about what to do and why. Um, some comments about the timing and just try to talk about this from the business owner standpoint. And then hopefully also make sure that you've got some resources to follow up with, including our organization. Um, the, the first thing that I will say is that um, this to me is kind of an issue about short-term cash versus long-term cash. And it's really critical that for the business owner, we kind of know where we're at with short-term cash. I think from a long-term standpoint, everybody's going to be fine. There's plenty of money flowing into the system. Uh, but the short-term standpoint is more challenging. And first of all, uh, how do I even get my arms around what is the amount of money that I, that I need? And we're thinking that you know, you ought to have a handle on three months of, of cash or financial resources. Uh, some of this work that I'm going to say, I'm going to credit to our consultant, Ben McConnell, who's kind of taking the lead with our consulting team on just guiding them through this process. But um, let, let's say you've done, as the business person, some initial work to uh, get your expenses tightly reduced. Um, uh, if you have a lease uh, or rent payment that you're making, you've gone to the landlord, are they willing to do anything for you? Can they give you a deferral? Can they stop some payment for a time period? And that's gonna vary widely by the landlord. So that's rent, number one. Number two would be um, um, uh, the people side of things. Have you made decisions about people? And you know, it's very important that we build teams and have them, but uh, this is making some tough decisions uh, apparent for the business owner. So people is number two. And we're also going to talk about the PPP program. And number three would be your bank loans. Uh, if you've got outstanding loans, if you talk to the banker about that, um, have you found out if they're doing any programs or deferrals? Um, so if you had that discussion and after you've done those things, uh, try to work yourself up a monthly budget and say, this is what I think I need per month, and then multiply that times three, and now you've got a three month um, nut that you need to cover, so to speak. So that's a pretty important initial part of this. Um, uh, so that kind of gives you a feel for what kind of uh, uh, dollars you're working with. Um, the other part related to that I'm gonna say is that if you have a relationship with your banker, uh, for those of you that have bank loans that have a banking relationship, that's a really valuable relationship right now because you need to find out what your bank is doing as far as any deferred payments, as far as uh, uh, any special programs they might be doing because of the COVID crisis. You might be able to get a line of credit from your bank because they already have your history. So that's a really important asset to be able to take advantage of right now is your current banking relationship for reasons I'm going to talk about a little bit later. Um, so that that's kind of the big picture of what we're trying to do as far as the numbers go. Um, if you want a little more detail on this, I know I have a video up on our website at LarimerSBDC.org. Uh, Becky and Terry and Kat have done a lot of great work to put information about managing the COVID crisis on there, but there's a video about Cash is King. Uh, Mueller and Associates has got a great video out, same sort of subject, and then there's also some content there about alternate revenue channels, e-commerce work, uh, and that's all on our particular website. So that's a very good resource. Um, 
so what I'm going to talk about next are the government programs that are coming down as a result of the CARES Act. The first one that's come out that was in the news is the, the SBA idle loan or uh, economic injury disaster loan. This is where you can apply for a loan through the SBA disaster organization. It's a specialized department of the SBA and the application only takes about 15 minutes and that gets you started in the loan process. But the additional component of this that's of interest to all of us right now when you're talking about quick money is to is that you can apply for uh, what's called an advance and the advance is totally forgivable as long as you use it for the allowable expenses that are spelled out in the program such as payroll rent um, uh, interest on loans operating expenses that sort of thing um, so uh, you just go onto that site, you apply for the loan, and then it's go also gonna ask you for your, your bank routing and account number because the objective is that after you've been approved for this advance, they wanna get the money back to you pretty quickly. So that's how that part works. And we advise that you do this because it's free money on the advance side. You're, you're gonna get an amount of up to $10,000. It's not a flat 10,000, it's up to $10,000 that you can use uh, for, um, uh, for, your, for your allowable expenses. So that is, uh, that's item one. Um, and the, the advance is forgivable whether you get approved for the loan or not. So that's pretty, that's pretty easy money. Uh, so we recommend doing that. The second thing I wanted to mention is that if, if one of your businesses or your business already has an SBA 7A loan, an existing loan, uh, you're gonna get six months of that paid for principal and interest by the SBA as part of their debt relief program. So you might, uh, if you have a bank loan, you might wanna find out if that's an SBA loan, talk to your bank about it, see if that's eligible. Um, and probably the most recent program that has come down is the Payroll Protection Plan, the PPP loan. Uh, this is also a loan. It's designed to keep people in pay, employed. Uh, most of it is forgivable uh, to you as the employer, as long as you use at least 75% of the expenses for, uh, for payroll to keep your people working, and including uh, you know, paying yourself uh, as, the, <clears throat> as the owner. And there's information out there about the program. Um, uh, the tricky part to this right now, though, is that this is not going through the SBA Disaster Loan Group. The PPP is going through the national SBA banking system. If you're an SBA uh, 7A lender, those are the organizations that are taking the PPP applications. The challenge is that each bank is handling this with their own policies, with their own programs. Uh, what we hear consistently is that the banks are taking care of their existing customers first. So if you're not a client of that bank, you're gonna be in the back of the line, so to speak, as far as getting that application uh, looked at. So, um, uh, if you have questions about employment, unemployment, making decisions about should people be laid off, et cetera, um, a great resource for that is the Larimer County Workforce Center. They are doing a lot of advice for businesses about this program. It's a very good resource just to walk through some scenarios. Uh, if you do have people, uh, employees that have been laid off or gonna be laid off, just make sure they've got the link to file for unemployment. And that is through the, uh, uh, the state Colorado Department of Labor and Employment. And we'll, we can pop up a link there for that particular organization. Um, so those are the programs. Um, as far as points of contact, uh, uh, our website, particularly under the COVID tab in the upper right hand corner, has got a lot of data about these programs. Uh, the Loveland Business Development Center has the same content. I'm also really recommending to people that keep an eye on the Larimer County Workforce Center website because that's going to have content about employees, unemployment benefits. Uh, and I would also uh, suggest that you check with your 
municipal town website because that's going to have content about is there a grant coming from your town are they deferring tax payments so that's another great source for what's going on locally in your area so those three things are, are places that i would check um, and i think the final thing that i'm going to talk about uh two final things before i turn it over to cat are um, uh, uh I, uh, in a prior uh, life, I owned a rustic furniture manufacturing company and uh, uh, about 15 years ago, I applied for an economic injury disaster loan from the SBA. And I did it because at the time, wildfires were going through Southern Colorado and Northern Arizona. They wiped out a bunch of uh, dealers, customers that I was selling furniture to and it really uh, impacted my revenue. So I was able to apply to the SBA. I got a $40,000 loan. Uh, it was a really useful uh, uh, infusion of short-term cash at a time when the company really needed it. And I was fortunately able to pay that back about three years later. So that is a useful process. I, I'm not going to tell you that it's fast, but it was useful and, uh, and the money there is real. Uh, the, the second thing that I wanted to mention is that uh, um, um, this it's really important that you keep track of your records and your your invoices and payments that you're making because the way this process generally works is you're not just going to get a check from the SBA that says here spend it how you want they're going to reimburse you for expenses that you've incurred after the fact so if you're making rent payments the SBA is eventually going to ask you for, hey, I need your invoices to the landlord, and I also need your bank statements or something like that showing that you paid that bill. And they're going to look to match it up. And when they've got proof that, okay, uh, this person legitimately paid 7500 bucks worth of rent and commercial insurance, et cetera, then they're going to send you a check to reimburse you for that. So it's really important that you have accurate records. And if you're fumbling around trying to find the records, that's much more of a delay that you're gonna incur to get reimbursed from the SBA. So um, that part is, is pretty important. Um, uh, Kat Rico, why don't I turn it over to you at this point? And uh, as Becky said, we're going to make some few opening comments and then we're gonna field questions and uh, through the chat, which Becky will moderate. So thank you. Well, good morning, everyone. Thanks for joining us. Um, I am Kat Rico. I am the program director for the Loveland Business Development Center. So I work very closely with the Larimer SBDC so that we're getting the most accurate information we can from the source. Um, and we offer those same services of the consulting, um, the online education. Uh, well, right now it's online. Uh, and then the connection to resources. So Mike has pretty well covered all of the financing pieces that um, that are out there right now. I would just let everyone know and remind everyone that these are moving targets and we are getting new direction every day on every single one of these programs. So, you know, the information that you have right now at this minute may not be the same tomorrow morning when we wake up. Um, that doesn't mean that it all needs to go out the window. Uh, that means that you just have to kind of keep track of what's going on. Now, once you get through the process of determining all of these pieces that you need to apply for, and if you have any questions or concerns on what's actually appropriate for your specific business, because it's not one size fits all, um, I would strongly recommend that you set up a consulting appointment. We've got over 15 consultants that are trained and up to date on the different disaster programs that are out there and they can help you determine which ones are the right ones for your business and then get you connected with those resources more quickly so that you're not spinning your wheels going through dozens and dozens and dozens of sources um, to try and find what you need. Uh, so I'd strongly recommend that if you're not already a client and you're not already connected with a disaster consultant, um, that you do so either through levelandbusiness.com or larimersbdc.org. Um, it's an extremely, extremely useful resource and we've got evening appointments. Um, they're all virtual right now, so they're either going to be a Zoom call like this or a phone call, um, but we'll get you connected with someone that can give you specific direction for your business. Um, the second part of this that I would really emphasize is we're starting to move to the point where a lot of you have probably already applied for some of these programs and you're kind of in hurry up and wait mode, right? So what do you do for your business in the meantime? 
Um, the business environment is going to shift after this. We don't know exactly what it's going to look like, of course, but um, while you're in hurry up and wait mode for the SBA and your bank and all of these other pieces to start processing these applications uh, and getting you cash in hand, you can do other things for your business. You can look at your marketing strategy. You can look at your operations strategy. You can look at you know, how many employees you have. Do you, are you gonna need the same amount of employees? Did you have to let people go and you're gonna have to rehire them and retrain them after all of this? Uh, and those are other things that our consultants can also help you address. So again, really relying on that consulting piece of the services that we offer. Um, not only can we help you with figuring out the financing piece, but then looking forward so that your business comes out of this stronger and more agile, I think is really, really important. So those are really the comments that I have to, to add. Mike, did you have anything else you wanna add before we hop into questions? Yeah, one final thing. Uh, we've been asked multiple times uh, whether these programs are applied to nonprofits, and the answer is, Yes, they do, but it needs to be a private nonprofit, which is generally a smaller nonprofit, more localized with limited uh, donors. If it's a public nonprofit, much bigger, a lot of donors, it is not eligible. I don't know the logic of why that breakdown, but that is the guidance that the SBA is, is putting out there. So that's all I had, Kat, thank you. I think uh, we can probably start out with some questions now. And, and Becky, we're gonna turn it over to you and we'll ask you to moderate this part of it, if you would. Um, so my first question is, Um, Inc. just published an article stating that the SBA is now going to base advance on number of employees, also that no funding has occurred yet. Yesterday I spoke with an SBA rep and they are slam and so the three day timeline for emergency advance is more like three weeks. Do you have any comment on that, Mike? Uh, we do know, yeah, we do know that it's, uh, I, I'm not aware of a single client in uh, Larimer County that has gotten any advanced idle money, so it is well beyond the, uh, the promised dates. Um, I, uh, I do read Inc. Magazine. I can't uh, verify that particular data about how the SBA is going to sort that, and I do know that it's up to $10,000. I don't think they're promising anyone the full $10,000 to, to my knowledge, but uh, we will look into that and try to get some better guidance on that. And and by the way, there's probably questions that are going to come up here that we can't answer on this call, but we will try to get some guidance on it going forward and, and get that back to the inquirer. So, uh, um, but yes, I'm. Uh, we're hearing that a lot and there is no good customer friendly way to follow up on that to see where your application is. You get a 800 number at the SBA disaster line, which uh, I'll ask Terry to share here. And there's also a disaster customer service at sba.gov uh, email, which he's also gonna put up. And that is how you could follow up on it. But if you're worried because you haven't got your advance money, you're in the same boat right now as everyone else who's applied. Okay. And I would say that along with um, the um, 800 number, I've heard varying time frames on, you know, how long it takes them to answer. Uh, a couple of days ago, it was, you know, you're waiting on the phone for three hours to get to a person. Yesterday, I heard as little as an hour. Um, I know that's still a, a long wait on the phone, but um, that's pretty much what they're telling people. Also, another guidance that I've gotten from another client that's um, spoken to the SBA trying to follow up on an application was to make sure that you are not answering any emails from the SBA that have an attachment. Um, there are scams that are starting to come out. Uh, the SBA will not send you anything with an attachment uh, via email. So just keep that in mind as you're trying to follow up on these things. Um, cybersecurity is always one of those things that we should be concerned about. And especially right now with the extreme amount of loans that are going out and people asking for money and your financials and things like that, make sure you're dealing with the actual SBA. So um, just keep an eye on that as well. Okay. Um, is there any information regarding how the payment protection plan will work for small businesses with no employees? So for example, independent contractors, partnerships, sole proprietors. 
I'm, I'm going to start out by saying that this is an area where a little more guidance is needed because this kind of comes down to whether you're better to take unemployment or whether you're better to take the PPP program. And in virtually all of the financial scenarios that I've seen, the person, if possible, is probably better to take unemployment. It's not a loan. It's going to run for a longer time period. It's a guaranteed amount of money. Um, but that might vary depending on your particular situation. And the reason there isn't clear guidance on this is because unemployment gets its guidance from the state of Colorado and the PPP program is a federal SBA program. So those two things aren't quite in sync yet. Uh, I do know that the state of Colorado head of the unemployment office is working to get some clarification on this. But uh, so I would say more guidance to come, but unless you've made a lot of money in your sole proprietorship business, uh, you're probably better off taking unemployment. Um, I will also say that um, um, on the PPP side, uh, it's not 100% clear of whether they're gonna count what you say paid yourself as a paid employee versus what you might've taken from distribution. So that's a gray area to be determined. And that would probably end my comment on that right now. Okay. Um, so Kat, is a partnership that has yet to have either partner take any type of paycheck considered under the EIDL loan? Um, are they considered two employees? It's the same scenario as the sole proprietors. They are looking at um, just the overall revenues of the business and, and what the owners have paid out. Um, so there may not be a whole lot of guidance on that either. Um, that's, that's really all I've got for, for the brand new businesses is they're trying to kind of relax some of these guidelines, but they are still writing them as they're rolling these programs out. Mike, yeah. do you have any more clarification on that? Well, I might say, yeah, one thing, um, the que this question related to idle as I'm reading it, uh, from Keith and, uh, I would say on the idle, uh, go ahead and apply because, um, uh, you're, go you're going to request the advance amount, which you're allowed to do under this, and that's gonna be forgivable as, as long as you um, use it for the eligible expenses. And, and those are defined in the program. I'm not gonna run through all those now, but the PPP is pretty much targeted at a payroll reimbursement part. So if your decision is whether or not I should apply for idle, you know, my recommendation is heck yes, apply for it. Uh, you're gonna get an advance, just make sure you use it for the allowable expenses and it's gonna be forgiven. Um, uh, you, you'll have to probably send in receipts at some point to prove that you used it so that they're going to allow it to be forgiven and it's not gonna stay with you as a loan that you didn't fill the requirements of. So that would be my, uh, my, my add to that, Cap. Okay. So if someone um, is business is based out of their home, do you guys know if any portion of the IDA loan can be used to pay utilities, mortgage, home expenses? Are those considered business operating expenses? Um, I would say if, if you've had a history of writing those off and you have to assume that when the SBA looks at this, they're gonna have access to your federal tax records. Mm -hmm. So if, if you've you know, written those off as an expense or claimed them as an expense is probably the better term, they're gonna allow that because that's consistent with what the business did. If you've never done that and you're trying to do it now for the purpose of this loan, my suspicion is that's gonna be a little harder uh, claim to make because you don't have a uh, a consistent message with how you handled that in the past. Um, uh, we, we will try to get some further clarification about that. Thanks. Um, so Kat, someone is applying for the PPP, but the bank is telling them um, basically nothing except we are working on it, no timeline um, or anything for that as of last week. Um, at what point would you recommend reaching out to another bank well, that's where it becomes a real question of making sure that you're working with a bank that you already have a relationship with, because um, that goes back to Mike's comments kind of at the beginning here, is if you don't already have a relationship with your banker 
or with that particular bank, um, you may be kind of last in line to get service through the PPP. Um, some of the banks have had their caps kind of lifted on how much they can lend, but it still comes down to having that previous relationship. Um, really, you probably are better off waiting for your bank, as long as they're an actual SBA lender at this point, um, because if they're not an SBA lender, they're, they're probably not going to be able to do the PPP for a little bit longer. Um, so, so we do have a relationship with them actually of 10 years and they keep saying they're not telling their lenders anything. So that's the reason why I was asking at what point do we just say, okay, we got to go someplace else. And then are there any banks that are not working with their current, that are working with people outside of their current clients, I guess was my question. It's really going by individual banks. We have a lot of information coming to us from our clients and from our banking partners um, that really it does come down to the individual bank. Um, there aren't necessarily any banks right now that are more responsive than others that we're finding. Um, it's just they're getting the information as, as quickly as they can as well. And they're trying to get through those applications as quickly as possible. Thank you. Can and I might add uh, on, uh, on our website, uh, there is a list of Colorado-based 7A lenders, and it's it's a couple of hundred. I mean, it's a big number, um, but those are the people that approved it. But we're hearing from a variety of banks that, okay, I got 200 new applications for this. I got 150 new applications for this because, um, you know, people are looking to get this, this loan, but the some of the banks that would be uh, willing to pursue this or want to start making these loans, they're not properly accredited or certified yet through the SBA. So there's far more demand right now than there is ability to supply these, these dollars. And Mike, just to add to that, can you speak to, um, is it different for independent contractors, sole proprietors, um, and other business owners as to when they're going to open up the PP program for those individuals? Yeah, that the the start date for that is tomorrow. It's it's Friday the tenth uh, for uh, businesses and uh, uh, larger businesses. It actually happened last Friday the third, so um, it, it'll be open to everybody as of tomorrow. Okay, perfect. Um, to clarify, PPP loan proceed proceeds are given as a reimbursement. The loan is not distributed in its entirety or as an advance. Um, that's correct. Uh, the way, uh, um, the way I understand it to work is that you, when you apply, you make a calculation, you're going to look at your payroll, you're going to have an average monthly cost. So there's a monthly payroll number. Uh, you can multiply that times 2.5. And that's the amount of loan that you are eligible to get. And I believe the way, and, and there's, it, let's say your business that, that already laid off your employees and now you decide to bring them back. Um, if you delay bringing them back, that amount of money I mentioned a few minutes ago could be reduced because they're not there in place for the full time. It's all designed to keep people employed. So, um, the, uh, the, the, the reimbursement process works where you're gonna ultimately need to submit a payroll record, maybe it's off of your QuickBooks uh, records, and then here's the proof of payment that I paid these people. And that is how I would expect it to unfold. And that goes along with why they want you to work with your existing bank, because your existing bank is gonna know what's normally consistent for what's going in and out of your accounts. And they're gonna be able to look at that a little bit more quickly. Um, that's why they're encouraging you to stay with your current banks as opposed to going to a brand new bank is just because of that history. Okay. And I think, um, I think that we might be able to answer this. We, we have not heard back from any businesses that have received a lo the loan yet. Is that correct? Uh, no, nobody's gotten any information about receiving the loan, but what I'm more concerned about is the advance money. I have not heard about anybody getting the advance money yet, and that's really important because that was the quick cash uh, coming in. So uh, that is 
moving slower than expected. I saw a comment in the chat, uh, but uh, uh, you know, we're obviously the SBA is under a lot of pressure to get this out uh, as soon as possible. Uh, I did want to make one other comment too. Um, I think I saw this in the chat, but uh, there was a question about, can I apply for both the SBA idle loan and the payroll protection plan loan? And the answer is yes, you can apply for both provided that you find a bank willing to take your PPP loan. Um, but what you want to do is make sure that uh, the money is used for different purposes. That's the key operating term, used for different purposes. So if you think of in terms of the big picture, the PPP part is designed for payroll. Uh, use that for payroll, use it to pay employees, use it to pay yourself if you've uh, paid yourself a salary, and then use the idle loan to pay other allowable expenses. Let's say you don't pay payroll from that, but maybe you pay rent, maybe you pay a loan, maybe you pay a commercial insurance policy. So that would be the way to set it up, but don't uh, use both loans to pay payroll because that will be seen as double dipping. Okay, and Kat, do you feel like um, if someone duplicates their application, they applied, didn't hear back, reapplied, um, that that could actually slow the process down? Well, it depends on if we're talking about the PPP or the EIDL loan. Um, from what we know with the EIDL loan, if you applied twice because they have changed the application a couple of times, you don't lose your place in the queue. Um, so if you applied early in the process, I think March 20th is when we were the first day that we could actually start submitting them through Colorado. And if you applied through that original process with the whole five PDF forms and everything like that, um, you are already in line. And if you went through and applied with the new streamlined application that was released a week and a half or so ago, um, you, you didn't lose your place in line and it shouldn't slow you down. Um, that's what we know, shouldn't. Uh, but on the PPP side, uh, there is that possibility, I think, if you're, especially if you're trying to apply from different banks, it could be seen as double dipping. Um, and so you really want to make sure on the PPP side that you are only applying once is what I would, I would advise. Okay. Um, and Mike, just to clarify, having a relationship with a bank means you have a checking account with them, you have a savings account, some type of a loan. That's what it means by having a relationship with a bank. Uh, generally, yes. Um, it's, you know, knowing, do you have a 7A loan? Because there are different types of loans. It could be a 504, uh, but a lot of small business loans are SBA backed loans. So it's really worth finding out what kind of loan you have. Uh, if you've got a relationship with a banker at the bank where they might say, hey, we got this program, or we're doing this for you because of the COVID situation, or have you thought about a line of credit? And there's, there's gonna be a big value on business speed. Um, you know, people that you can contact that can give you an answer maybe in a couple weeks, three weeks, because I'm afraid the government related stuff is gonna be slow. So anything that helps get access to money quickly is important. Um, that's kind of why the relationship with an existing bank is uh, uh, valuable. You mentioned uh, having account numbers. That uh, what, what type of account you have, that might vary by the bank. I've heard of uh, one bank saying, we want you to have a checking account. Others say we want to be a current customer. I can't say what that means bank by bank by bank, but that kind of gives you an overview of what, we're, what the banks are thinking about there. Um, uh, that's, that's my comment on that. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry. I'd want to, I had one other thing. Um, I want to keep in mind, too, and we bring this up with people, that uh, Colorado does have three uh, mission-based uh, lenders. They're called micro-lenders, and they lend money on kind of half philanthropic reasons, half like a bank would. And uh, they've been around for 35 years, very credible organizations. Their sweet spot to do loans is between ten dollars and $50,000. Uh, it's not going to be the best interest rate, but it is available money. And they're actively lending now. Uh, and those organizations are Colorado Enterprise Fund, Colorado Lending Source, and a, a Dream Spring, which was formerly known as Axion. Uh, Terry's going to put those up in a chat in a minute, just so you've got those contacts. But those are worth uh, checking into. 
Thank you. Okay. And along with them, they are also partnering with some other organizations. Um, I know like Colorado Enterprise Fund is partnering with one called Kiva, uh, who does smaller loans. Um, but you know, if you only need a small amount of cash, you can also check into some of those. Uh, and I believe that Colorado Enterprise Fund in particular has some links to Kiva um, to be able to, uh, so that you can check that out as well. And we've got links on our websites. Perfect. Um, so Victoria, this is your question. And I just want to clarify first, are you, so you wanted to, it says the application requires you to certify that you have employees. I'm told there's not a different application that will be available for contract workers or for those without employees. Which loan were you referring to? Hi there. Yeah, I'm referring to the PPP. Okay. I, I filled that out as an agent for a company with employees. Um, and then as a self-employed person, I was told from my personal bank that that's the same application you use, but you have to certify on there that you do have employees. So I was not sure how that would work. Okay. Uh, let me take a stab at that, Victoria. Um, on, on the big picture, uh, the PPP program covers employees. It is not intended to cover independent contractors because the independent contractors are expected to file their own paperwork. So whatever the PPP calculation is, it's supposed to be for just company employees. Um, I, I have heard that uh, the, the Treasury Department about 10 days ago came out with the application form for the applicant for the PPP program. And I've heard of a couple banks saying, don't worry about that, we're gonna have our own form. So again, that varies by bank, uh, but I know the SBA has a PPP application form along with an application guideline. I'd be happy to send that to you. Um, but generally that's what's expected to be used, but you might get some variation depending on the bank. Okay. Um, and Lisa, your question was, if you currently have an SBA loan, how do you get the six payments paid? Banks do not have guidance on this. Uh, that's a great question, uh, and it's a, it's a 7A loan. My understanding, Lisa, is that, that that payment is supposed to be being done automatically by the bank, and obviously the banks have to be notified from the SBA. Um, there's a lot of these notification and guidance processes that haven't rolled down yet. Uh, the CARES Act was still only passed 10 days ago, and sometimes it takes months between the time legislation gets passed and we have actual working documents and the banks have guidance and the business have firm applications be supposed to be filled out. So there's a lot of scrambling and interim steps that are occurring right now. But my understanding, and I, I will follow up on this, but my understanding is, is that's supposed to happen automatically from the bank to the, to the borrower. Perfect. Um, so Viviana is going to be trying to be proactive. Um, she said they've already submitted applications for both the EIDL and the PPP loan and was curious while they're in the hurry up and wait period, would you recommend that they set up new business checking accounts for the loan funds to make tracking expenses easier? Kat, thoughts? You know, I've gotten that question a couple of times and you know, it comes down to that documentation point. If you really feel that it's necessary, I don't know that it's um, the best idea considering the banks are very overloaded right now and setting up new accounts is gonna put more strain on them, um, especially if you can track those expenses and where you're paying out from the loans through like QuickBooks or whatever accounting software you use. I think that that's a better idea um, rather than just setting up separate accounts. Mike. What are, you, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I'm, I'm reading the question and I'm going to assume that you've already got your business stuff separate from your personal stuff. I'm you know, always in favor of that because those should never be commingled because it complicates life for everybody, uh, particularly your accountant if you use one or your own accounting. But if you're talking about now setting up an additional business checking account, I'm gonna completely agree with, with Kat. Um, you know, I think you're kind of, take an unnecessary step unless the bank is giving you some like really positive feedback that, yeah, we're going to look seriously at your PPP application, set up an account with us. Um, 
that might be one thing, but if you're just doing it in the hopes, they might give you a favorable thumbs up. I think you're, I, I think that's um, not going to be help, not going to be the way I would go. Okay. Hey, Nancy, would you mind jumping in on that question? Because I saw you had a response on there as well. I was just going to say, if you have QuickBooks, whether desktop or online or, or even Sage, um, instead of setting up a separate account, you could set up a project or job, and just as you write checks, you could post it to that. Then you have an easy report while you're still recording it to rent expense or payroll or utilities versus setting up another checking account that you'll have to have checks for, you'll have to reconcile. Um, in QuickBooks, if you didn't want to do in QuickBooks, you could also utilize the class feature if you didn't want to set up a job, but I think using a job or a project um, feature, whether it's in QuickBooks or Sage, would be an easier way, and then you can just run reports, and you're not opening up new bank accounts and all of that other fun stuff that goes along with that. Thanks, Nancy. That is the last question I have in the chat group. Does anybody else have any questions? Mike? Uh, I would just like to throw out one question to everybody that uh, thank you very much for listening in. Uh, and if, if you want to talk to us individually, uh, we're setting up a whole bunch of uh, free one-on-one -on -one consulting to talk to people about this. We've got about 15 consultants that are trained on these programs to talk to you about it relative to your business. Uh, they're doing the normal daytime hours plus evenings plus Saturdays. So just contact us at uh, www.larimersbdc.org or lovelandbusiness.org and we oh, will come. Uh, Loveland. Uh, sorry, <laughs> come. Sorry, come. And we're happy to get you set up with that. It's a uh, it's really valuable just to have uh, someone else to to bounce it off of who's looking at multiple businesses that are dealing with similar issues. Um, and beyond that, I would just like to throw it out just for feedback for us. Was this helpful to you folks listening? Any comments, suggestions? We would love to hear them as we do this going forward. Before anyone answers, Mike, there was another question that popped up. Um, can businesses, sole proprietors, contractors with an ITIN number apply for any loans at all? Uh, the answer is yes, they can. There just needs to be documentation that you are here legitimately. It's going to be a lot harder if you're undocumented. And by the way, we also have a Spanish-speaking consultant that can uh, cover these topics in Spanish as well, too. Um, so you're getting a lot of feedback. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Very helpful. Very helpful. Thank you. So, yes. Okay. Oh, um, one more quick question. What is the best option for a salon owner when everyone is a 1099? Uh, I would make, I, I would, uh, sorry, Kat, were you going to say something? No, go for it. Uh, I would make sure that your uh, 1099 people have access to either, I tell them about the two programs, you know, they can apply for SBA IDLE just like you can. And I would tell them about filing for unemployment. I mean, that just make sure they look at those options and sort them out because it's probably a better deal for them to collect unemployment. And you as the salon owner, uh, you know, you look at both of these programs that we've talked about and, and take advantage of them. And on the unemployment side for 1099s, um, that is something that's relatively new with the CARES Act. That's something that Colorado hasn't had before. Um, Mike, do you know if they have that application up yet on the uh, unemployment website? Because I, from what I understood um, as of earlier this week, uh, sole proprietor or independent contractors couldn't apply for unemployment quite yet because they were releasing the application soon. Uh, it is not finalized nor up yet, but I think they're expecting it any day. Yeah. Okay, I had a couple more questions uh, pop in. Um, so this is from a couple of people that just joined. So sorry if we're repeating here. Um, I filed for unemployment before the PPP loan became available. My PPP loan is based on my salary plus my employees. Can I keep the unemployment? I haven't gotten either payment. Um, 
just so I understand that, so the person has filed for unemployment plus they've applied for the PPP loan? Rachel, are you still on? Rachel? Okay, I'm, yeah, I'm not sure. That's right, I will make a general comment. Um, my suspicion is that that's gonna get sorted out somewhere along the line and they're probably not gonna allow you to take a forgivable PPP loan, which includes you, plus have you get paid mm -hmm. un unemployment insurance. That will get figured out between the state and between the feds. I am pretty confident about that. So um, you can file for both, but I would kind of prepare yourself for which one you're gonna to wanna to choose. Um, and by the way, I saw one other question here too about a uh, gentleman whose business is just open January 1st and so no tax history. Uh, was that a brand new business or did you buy that? I'm, assume, I'm gonna assume that you just opened it. Um, my, my suggestion is to apply for the SBA idle loan, try to get an advance. Um, there's no history to pull. Uh, however they're doing that. So that might be iffy, but it's only gonna take you 10 or 15 minutes to apply. So I would recommend apply for it and see how it goes. It's, it's not like it was three weeks ago where it took you four hours to do the application. Okay, um, just a couple more and then we're gonna wrap up. Do we know when the UI app is ready? No, we, we don't know yet. We're just okay. waiting for them to get all those pieces in place. Okay. Um, what are your general thoughts on the work share program? Would you recommend it to a small business with five employees, none of, none of whom have been let go at this point? Uh, I'm not familiar with the work share program. I'm thinking a more knowledgeable organization for that would be the Larimer County Workforce Center. You could talk to either Adam Crow or Andrew Miner there, and they would be the people to talk to about that, that know the details of that. Okay, and do we know um, how and when, how we will be notified when the UI app is ready? Uh, I'm gonna suggest, Kat, when that's finalized, let's both put it up on our websites. We'll put it up under the COVID tabs, and we'll also send out a client communication on that through Constant Contact. Perfect. And now that you guys are all here, it means that you're registered in our system, so um, you should be receiving emails from you know one of us, uh, if not maybe even both of us. <laughs> Perfect. So Mike and Kat, thank you so very much. That was the last question. Unless you guys have something further to say. Um, thank you everybody for all you're doing. Appreciate it. Hang in there. You. Yeah, thank you. And if you have, um, I know entrepreneurs tend to kind of congregate together and they know each other. Um, so if you know of other business owners that are struggling, please encourage them to reach out to either Loveland Business Development Center or Larimer SBDC. Um, if they're in Weld County, of course, East Colorado SBDC, and if they're down a little bit further south in Longmont or so, um, reach out to the Boulder SBDC because all of us have excellent resources and we're here for you guys. Kat, do you want to throw your phone number out real fast? Yeah, um, you can reach me at the uh, LBDC at 970-667-4106. And for the Larimer SBD, it's 970-498-9295. Awesome. Well, thank you everyone for joining today. Um, this video has been recorded, so I will be posting it and sending it to you later for future reference. Thank you, everybody. Have a great day.